back in was it the late seventies, early eighties? Um, Greg was in a a commune, like a cult. Um, yeah. That's a point. Yeah, it was called a commune at the time. It was mm -hmm. later recognised to be a cult. Just watch the thoughts that go through. Don't stop them, don't hold on to them. Just watch the thoughts going through your mind. Centre point. The regular Saturday afternoon meeting. A community of over 60 members operating as a trust with 70 acres of land and assets of over half a million dollars. Singles, solo parents, families predominantly middle class, often university educated. Moments of quiet as Bert Potter, the community's spiritual leader, prepares to talk. When you're ready, would you just open your eyes, please? Try and stay in that quieter space. We were asked how our community goes, how it works. My answer really is, start it and see. Find out for yourself. Don't look for theories. Don't try and work out exactly what's going to happen. Don't come up with all the nice ideas about it. Don't get into your head and theorize about all the loving feelings again that are going to be there and all the energy that you're going to create. Get in and create it. Do something about it. Feel it as it goes along. Let it become a growing process. Because the one thing that's certain is that what you do this year will be almost totally invalidated next year. If you're not prepared to accept the growth and the movement that happens, then don't think about communities. Get into a nice little comfortable house in the suburb somewhere, uh, put your fences up all around it, keep the gate closed, and shut yourself off. And you can probably keep things at a fairly low level. But if you move into a community, the first thing is to accept that there's going to be changes. Finding out how to get along with one another. Working out methods of resolving all the conflicts and the stresses that come up. I think this is really the key to any community, is how do you resolve the stresses and problems that come up? Because they're always there. That you can't possibly have a community without them. And so really it's a way of working out these dynamic problems between people that's important. Bird Potter's solution to interpersonal conflict is the continuing use of psychotherapy. After giving up a successful career as a businessman, his growing interest in group therapy led to the establishment of Centre Point two and a half years ago. He could put his theories into practice. It went for quite a while. It was in Albany on the North Shore. I've been there. Tam's been there and stayed a night. Yep. I've been there and, you know, taken him there and picked him up and things like that because I was doing my nursing training in Auckland and he was at architecture school. Okay. Um, at the same time. So, and he had a girlfriend, I don't know how he met her, called Kate. And she was 16 yeah. and lived, and he was only about 19 himself, 19 or 20. And um, he, oh, probably not, 18, 19. 18, yeah, 18. 18. And um, so he moved in with her at, at the, because she was living with her mum at Centre Point, and he moved in with her. Um, and he did have a friend that Richard says was, had, been a, had been his adversary. I thought his name was Mike, but maybe it's mm -hmm. not. And I met them a few times and they were best buddies after after they'd been in the session in this room for, what is it, a week or 10 days? It's or 15. Something? There was the guy who started the cult, um, the commune, Bert Potter. Bert Potter. It was his son that Greg had issues with. Probably actually when you look back at it now, it's just that power because he was the son of the cult leader and Greg wanted to be up there. Right. And uh, one of the therapy sessions that, the two of them were involved in is where 15 people, male and female, all go into one room and they stay there for a week. There's a shower and a toilet and their meals are, um, you know, just put in through a slot in the door. So they're naked. And yeah, and they're all naked. And that Greg told Tam this. Yeah, and he said the, the, the idea of that whole cult, it seemed to be, from what I got from it, was that sex seemed to be the therapy for everything. So they basically just bonked out everything, all their problems. And so somehow Greg and um, and Otter's son got to be best buddies during these fifteen. 
period people were in a room for a week. And then and then later on, a few years later, um, this guy, the guy who's Bert Potter's son, this guy married Greg's old girlfriend, Kate. Kate. Oh, okay. Yeah. But as, as that cult work, the cult leader was in prison for paedophilia, and I remember... So was his son, Rick said. Oh. In and, 1993. Um, Bert had, like, a, a toilet. He had his toilet, and next to his toilet, he had a little kitty toilet. Right. So, no, it was like a, it was like a grown-up's toilet, but smaller. Okay. For children. So, you know, he could sit on the toilet with children, I suppose. But anyway, part of his weirdness. Right. Um, yeah, but but also, um, yeah, there was just a lot of pedophilia going on there. there um, I can't remember... Nobody if, knew for a long time. I now. can't remember if exactly if this was a, something that I heard a guy say on during the night that I stayed there, or if it was something that I heard on a documentary about um, Centrepoint Community. And he said that... He, we had to do. They, they had to do something about the children because there was a four-year-old girl went around all the men asking for somebody to sleep with her to have sex with her, until somebody said yes, and eventually somebody said yes, and that was just like a huge. That that was just mind blowing, that they could have that kind of effect on a baby. Yeah, you know, she's still a baby. Four yeah, four years old. old. Her, it's normal. Mm. Yeah, and that, that, that that's the devastating thing. Frightening. That is frightening. I mean, mm. that that's yeah. The mindset and, is that's just normal, and uh, I, yeah. And I, I think Greg thinks that. Um, well, well, Greg's hate of pedophilias, which you know everybody hates pedophiles. Yeah, pedophiles. Yeah. Um, yeah. and then they have a competition. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, that that it's because he was friends with and lived with um, other paedophiles and he knew it was going on and he let it go on and he didn't speak up about it. So, so it's probably a guilt thing. Quite, totally a guilt thing, I reckon. It's, root, it's rooted, by, rooted from his connection to that community. That yeah, and whether he was... He speaks you know, out against it. Doing it himself, who knows, you know? So it could I mean, be, it could either it could be perhaps... Never, he was never um, obviously anti-gay or anything before he went there. I don't remember mm -hmm. there being anything. He wasn't anti-gay really until I came out. When I came out as a lesbian, then he got very anti-gay. But he's probably anti-gay from the from the that time. Mm. So the all, all, all of this stuff probably comes from there. He doesn't probably want to be associated with what happened there. Um, and either that, either it's a guilt thing for being associated with cult that um that had all this going on or you know or he may have been involved we don't know i'm not going to say that he was but and maybe he's ashamed or maybe just doesn't want people yeah. to know the best way to do that is to be a, a figurehead in mm. these pedophile rings and um and obviously in some of his books he says a lot of um homophobic uh, uh mark remarks in his books actually mm. People that told that read them, I haven't read them myself. I told him that. So, um, and like you say, he didn't seem to be um, homophobic or um, have any kind of real uh, outspoken gripe against paedophilia before um, that cult was investigated. And, and mm. so, that's just my observation. That yeah, it probably is rooted from that. And and everybody just thought, you know, at first they thought I was cool, you know, the commune was cool because it was, you know, in the 70s and it was, you know, sexual experiences and free love and all the rest of it. And everybody said, oh, yeah, it's cool. We've got, and we've got one just down the road sort of thing. But nobody mm. knew what was really going on there. Mm. Cool. And when you went there to move in there, you had to give all your worldly donations, right, like all your possessions. Everything. You had to give all, all, your, money. all your possessions and... Um, it was just communal, communal wardrobe. Everybody would just first up their stress, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, when you left, you left with nothing. Right. So people sold their houses and everything. Wow, yeah. I mean, yeah. it sounds like, um, you know, Gray has his own cult now and people are also... Trying. <laughs> He's trying. 
<laughs> well, we, we, yeah. But it's working, you know. Yeah, very it's got a lot of followers. <laughs> He's just ridiculous. Yeah. I, I, I just find it um, just too stupid now. It's just got all far too stupid. It gets more stupid and more stupid. Uh, I mean, he's, 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 that is that every, every movie is connected to him. Every movie's got a comment on it that is, oh, that's about me. It's, it's yeah. Even uh, when we, we, uh, we spoke to our local policeman on the island, and uh, when Mandy got what she thought was a death threat from um, from uh, one of Greg's followers, Nathan. and and she yeah, and she said, yeah, and the the cop just said, this just totally reminds me of um, a movie. He said, I think it was Total Recall. It it was just Greg making up rap. I can't remember the movie now even, but. But it, it is just everything is a movie. He thought it was hilarious. Yeah. He was rolling off his chair. Yeah. <laughs> the cop, the whole time we were with him, he was just cracking up laughing. So what do you know, um, Greg, Greg was taken to court a lot, am I right, when he was in New Zealand? Um, yeah, he tended to get punched in the face a lot. <laughs> he's got a very punchable face. He's got a very punchable face, yeah, yeah. A lot of people say that he's got a very trusting face and uh yeah, well, see i think those people must be on the spectrum mm. yeah maybe so um so yeah he did get punched <laughs> so how many times did he get punched in the face well i don't know more than he would have been taken to court yeah <laughs> taken two people to court i think for punching him in the face okay right <laughs> He had, I mean, that says a lot about him as well. I mean, how many people get punched in the face? Or, you know, it's not a common thing. I don't think, at least I don't think, I, I don't get punched in the face often. Or, no. I don't think. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah. He, <laughs> do, he does things like when, um, I think I've told you this before, when he was working on a, um, a mud brick house, him and, and his partner, business partner um, were doing this house build together and Greg went out to the site and um, told all the, all the workers, all the labourers and the builders that when he left home, he was up here. And now that he's back, now that he's on the work site, he's way down here. He's like way down, way down here at mm. their level. He was up at this level. Now in their, in their company, he's now at this level. Mm. And that's why he gets punched in the face. <laughs> okay. Well, that's an explanation. So, so one time, I know one of the things he said when he got when Greg saw the video that we'd made with Mum, um, he'd he he didn't said, see it. "Oh, that's right." He said he couldn't see it. He was the only person on the planet who couldn't see it. So we must put a spell on it because I'm a witch. So I must have oh, put yeah. a spell on it so that he couldn't see it. But he still managed to get our pictures off there and onto um, Cinderella's smugly smugly oven two sad blisters. So he 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 could he could, he obviously did see some of it. He said that um, that oh that when when he was about twelve, mm -hmm. I'd thrown a pair of scissors at him, or I'd gone to throw a pair of scissors at him, right, yeah. and he grabbed the scissors. Um, but in actually, what what actually happened was I was sewing, and he was hassling me, punching me, and you know, being a, just being a twelve year old dick, and mm -hmm. he punched me. He punched me on my developing breast, so, uh, and that's and it really hurt. So I I picked up the scissors and threw them at him. I mean they weren't open or anything, you know they wouldn't even have yeah. hit him, but and wouldn't have done any damage. And then a few days later, I had this black as my jumper bruise come out on my boob, and I thought, oh God, it's going to rot, and I'm going to lose a hole in my boob. So I went and showed Mum because I hadn't said anything. And I went and showed Mum, said, well, look what Greg did. He punched me, and so she called him over, and he said. Oh, she threw a pair of scissors at me, and so I got the blame. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because because I, you know, I was thinking, well, afterwards, after I've been told off, you know, for throwing the scissors, um, I thought, actually, I threw the scissors because he punched me. Yeah, and, yeah. And then you went anyway. uh, like a, a massive black, you know. Yeah. Well, it was it was actually quite small, but it was so dense and so big. Oh. That I thought it had, it had got, you know, it had gone all the way through, but you know, my fourteen-year-old brain. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So, but, uh, yeah, he he would do things like that. Um, yeah, yeah, and and uh, he wrote affidavits. He wrote affidavits 
like taking his take his ex-wife to court to get more custody and to get the amount paid lowered. So he was paying fourteen dollars a week mm. to support his child, and he and he wanted it, he got it down to ten dollars a week to pay for his child. Right. Ten dollars. And his his ex wife was at university doing a double degree on a on a single mother's benefit, living in a one room, one bedroom um, concrete block apartment. She lived in the lounge, and her daughter had the bedroom and stuff like that, and lived there for years on next to nothing. Um, Mum gave her a car, and Greg didn't like that either, and um, and. He took her to court and then and mum went as support because he was accusing mum of um, you know, being talking to her and stuff like that, you know, and 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 he had to put in an affidavit to and you know, an affidavit is supposed to be the absolute truth, nothing but the truth. And the affidavit is actually it's absolutely hilarious. I don't know <laughs> if we've still got a copy, but it's hilarious. He said that his father was a um was an um, alcoholic who perspired alcohol. Um, his mother was a depressive. Um, see medical records, 1970. You know, when she had four children from five down. Well, she, it, was, it wasn't 1970, it was about 1963. And um, she'd been to a dentist. He went, Mum went to the dentist to get some work done on her teeth and um, the dentist used dirty instruments and it, her, she got gingivitis, she had to have all her teeth out. She was pregnant with Tam. She already had three kids um, under four, under five, and um, they'd just built a new house, um, their first house, and they'd been donated all the wood, you know, from friends and given them, you know, they were popular people and they, they'd, been, they'd always done a lot in the community. And then they'd been given the wood and then dad had a car accident and broke his neck. So he was in wow. a plastic so, cast from he here to work. here and here to here and he couldn't work, couldn't move, mum couldn't drive and um, she went to the doctors and the doctor gave her a prescription for Valium for a month. I'm not and surprised, so, it must have been very hard for her, all of that going on. Yeah. And, so, and so this is what Greg said, that she's a depressive. Check medical records, you know, I mean, <laughs> really? I mean, She's a upbeat person. That's and, really um, low to do that. I mean, come on. Yeah. It's your own mother yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 No, that's not yeah. the only thing. That's not the only thing that he. Um... Oh no no he had to, he had to put something about all of us. So then he went on to Nick, that Nick um, ran a sex for drugs ring in Australia. <laughs> um, Nick, Nick, our brother Nick. Nicholas. Brother, uh, yeah. Who um, I think Greg must just be jealous because Nicholas is better looking than him, yeah, and and, it, and and had much better friends, and, and still got his friends, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and had women yeah. had women stop him in the street and ask for his phone number. This is back in the seventies, eighties, because he was uh -huh. so good looking. Yeah. yeah, his his girlfriends won the Miss whatever their country was competitions. Those kind of oh right, yeah. yeah. So yeah. like models are approaching his brother, and he's got jealous basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. and and um. And then he said that Tam was a... Um, 95 kilo bull dyke, he said. Oh, a, a 95 kilo bull dyke. Looks, uh, looks, looks like, like a, a man. man. And then in brackets, put a fisherman. And then in more brackets, check wedding photos. So this Sorry, is on, the, on an affidavit? On an yeah. affidavit. Yeah, to prove that I was... On aff that she was ugly. And that I was married to a woman because that obviously was a crime. Yeah. I and, mean, what's um, going on in his head? To do that, is he... Is he and, get to you? And, Nothing, and then the, and then there was there was only you? me there was only me left, you know. It was sort of like, well, what about oh, and my other sister's schizophrenic, and so's your daughter. Mm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cut that in there at the end, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll put that in. And you know, yeah. when he puts when he puts an edited, uh, uh, he puts an edited added bit on. You know that he's making it up, yeah. Because he'll say one, two, three things, and then he'll go and and you know, so mm. like and her daughter. And mm. she's the only one he has any contact with. She's not schizophrenic, and neither am I. But um, you know, if I was, it's still not, still doesn't need to go on an affidavit. Yeah. Because <laughs> he was trying to get the judge to say, um, "I don't want my daughter associating with these people." Mm. Yeah. And if and even if you did have schizophrenia, you still come across a lot less crazy than him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a hell of a lot. 
Um, but that's yeah, not the only time that he's, um, uh, you know, been so that disrespectful to your mother. Because um, uh, another time, didn't he send a bill to your mother for ruining yeah. your life? Yeah, yeah. He, he uh, twice he did it. The, um, when when it all when the shit all hit the fan in about nineteen eight, seven eight. Yeah. Um, actually, it might even have been a bit later than that. It might have been no. two thousand. No, it wasn't. It was seventy seven. And he was taken away. Oh, yeah. Okay. And um, I mean, and nine, seven ninety eight. He was he was the architect for her house. She designed it. She said what she wants. She's very good at that. You know, she's designed her house that she's got over there and it's beautiful. And she knows exactly what she wants, where it's going to be and everything. And he just has to draw the plans and work with the builder. And it was during this time, the house was about half done. And it was only a little place. Um, and she had her granddaughter, his daughter, for the weekend. It wasn't Greg's weekend, but he, um, she had her, and mm -hmm. she had to go to Auckland where Greg lived. But another part of Auckland, she had to go to Auckland to see her sister for something. They were going up there for something, so they went there, spent the night, and came back. And Greg found out that she'd been in Auckland and hadn't taken his daughter to see him, even though he's on the other side of the city, and has no really no contact with her. Um, he got shitty about that and um, threatened her, threatened her life. And the police got involved. She rang the police. The police said, leave, take off, find somewhere safe to hide. And so I took mum into hiding with my um, wife at, and um, uh, we went to a house in the country that belonged to another family member and that Greg wouldn't know about. And... Uh, stayed there, spent half the night on the phone to the police um, psychologist who oh, had no Greg because they were looking for him, they were hunting for him. And um, she said he's very intelligent and he knows what to say. She knew there was something off with him, but she just couldn't work out what. She was actually a psychiatrist because she, uh, yeah, she spoke to me, she rang me as well and um, said she just couldn't pinpoint it. But so they had nothing to hold them on really, you know, and blah, 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 it all, it all got, got let mm. go. But that's when he sent her, because he stopped doing any work on the house then, and he sent her a bill for $30,000 for his, um, his input so far. I don't know how much architects cost, but I can't imagine it would be, you know, $30,000 for a little, a little, a little, you know, a little two, little two bedroomed house, one level apartment, yeah, house. house. Um, and then, not long after that, he sent her a bill for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for ruining his life. Yeah, because he had a shit life and it was her fault. <laughs> um, yeah, he has a shit life because he's an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I lost for words with that. That's a, a lot of money. Uh, yeah. Money to um, ask your mother for. When we first came back from um, living overseas, Greg and I both came back about the same time, 1990, end of 1990, they might have come back yeah. early 91. Um, he painted a fence for mum and he said to me, do you think I should charge her? And I said, no, she's your mother. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you want a bill for changing your nappies? <laughs> That's right, she should send some bills back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did suggest that, but you know, so oh, no, no, <coughs> no, she wouldn't do that. What well, part of what you showed in your last video was a sort of family tree because one of Greg's big thing is, um, you know, his time yeah. he is king. You know, apparently Anne Boleyn, you know, survived um, the Tower of London and had uh, another child, and he's uh, I guess a descendant from that timeline, uh, which makes him the, the legitimate heir. Uh, Although no royalty involved. Sorry? Although no bloodline, royal bloodline involved. No, no. So, I mean, you guys shared, uh, you guys shared uh, your own um, research on your family history, right? You yeah. Showed, and you I tried to show it in the, in the video. Yeah. And you've got it now, haven't you? Yeah. So you sent it to me. So... Um, and the new one, I've just done that one. And that goes, that goes from, I've just put his name on there. Yeah. And it just got down the male line, just okay. to protect the privacy of, of the uh, you know the other 
everybody else everybody else is still alive and it yeah. goes back to to um to 1626 and then the father above that who is also a john hallett and he died in 1674 but um i can't find any birth records of him but he would he would be born around the 1600 33 so he, he could have been a great great grandson but there's no i mean these guys were um laborers mm -hmm. and, and nobody moved out of um out of the brighton area okay out of, out of sussex so in all those generations they were all within two or three villages which mm. are now part of brighton you know staining and stuff like that if he's got a claim our father is the youngest of three sons and just within that family of of from of four kids from our grandfather there's 80 claimants before greg yeah 80 they're 80. prolific creatures. 80. one of our cousins had 11 kids so is that i mean because obviously the laws of succession have changed haven't they now um so yeah i'm counting the girls so, so even so, even within that, our family greg is the second son yeah, yeah. So and, and you, you say that is counting the girls or not counting the girls? No, no I, that's counting. I've counted the girls. So that includes yourself, Amanda? Yeah, so, but not Tam, because I'm youngest. Yeah. She's so, younger than Greg. So have you any interest in, in the throne of England? Oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered because, you know, we go in for a counterclaim there, couldn't we? Oh, yeah, no, I couldn't feel. do anything worse. You know, I live on, we live on a little island of 400 people and yeah, and, and I've got a beach out the front and I look at and I'm quite happy to do that and not even go into the village to the shop. I mean, that's surprising. That's something people should really kind of take on board because Greg kind of has no proof of this uh, timeline, this family tree that he puts out. But you guys have got one from um, Ancestry.com or something, one of those official... Um, sites where you can find trace back your lineage yeah and, and on that it proves that there's so many more people ahead of him on that sort of bloodline um yep. to have yep. argument is that it doesn't have it doesn't work that way it's because of his special spiritual because of his, the day because of his birthday because of the time that he was born which sometimes he says is the 14th of september and sometimes he says is the 15th of september it's, yeah. it's to do with the um, time, time changes because he's born on the 15th in New Zealand and if it was in the morning, that was the 14th in, in England. I see. So, yeah. so yeah, he's just, you know, playing with a little yeah. bit. Yeah, everything he says, there's a tiny element of truth in it. Not yeah. about us, though. Yeah. We're not here yeah. about yeah. it. We are his sisters. 